Welcome back to Crime Science, where we explore the most haunting and perplexing cases, shedding light on the dark corners of justice and uncovering the truths that often go unnoticed. I'm your host, Derek Mogolski, and today we're revisiting a case that shocked the nation. A case that seemed open and shut when the perpetrator confessed, but one that left many questions unanswered. This is the story of Chris Watts, a seemingly devoted husband and father who murdered his pregnant wife and two young daughters in cold blood. But this isn't just about the horrific crime itself. It's about what happened after. It's about how the justice system, in its rush to close the case, may have left crucial stones unturned. Did the investigation into the Watts family murders end too soon? And what does this mean for our pursuit of truth and justice in such cases? To understand the shortcomings of the investigation, we need to go back to the beginning, to those first critical days when Shanann Watts and her two daughters, Bella and Celeste, were reported missing. It was August 13th, 2018, when Shanann's friend, Nicole Atkinson, grew concerned after she couldn't reach Shanann and noticed that she had missed a scheduled doctor's appointment. Nicole contacted the Frederick Police Department and from that moment, a series of events were set in motion that would eventually lead to Chris Watts' shocking confession. From the outset, something seemed off about Chris. His demeanor was detached, his answers evasive. He initially claimed that he had no idea where his family was, suggesting that Shanann had taken the children and left. Yet there was no sign of a struggle, no evidence to support his claim. The neighbor's surveillance footage, which would later play a pivotal role, showed Chris backing his truck into the driveway and loading something into the back, but there was no sight of Shanann or the girls leaving the house. The investigation that followed was swift. Within a day, the police had obtained search warrants and began gathering evidence. Cadaver dogs were brought in and the police meticulously combed through the Watts' home. But despite these efforts, there were already signs that the investigation was focusing too narrowly on Chris Watts without fully exploring all possibilities. For instance, Chris's initial interviews with law enforcement were rife with inconsistencies. He was caught in lie after lie. Yet the investigator seemed more interested in getting a confession than in building a case based on solid, corroborated evidence. When Chris finally confessed to the murders on August 15th, just two days after his family was reported missing, it felt like the end of the story. But was it really? In his confession, Chris claimed that he killed Shanann in a fit of rage after she allegedly strangled their daughters claim that was not only contradictory, but also inconsistent with the physical evidence. Shanann's autopsy showed no signs that she had been involved in a struggle, and the autopsies of Bella and Celeste revealed that they had been smothered. Yet, despite these discrepancies, the investigation seemed to accept Chris's version of the events without question. This brings us to a critical point in our discussion. The concept of a rush to closure in criminal investigations. When Chris Watts confessed and eventually pled guilty to the murders, the investigation effectively stopped. There was no trial, no cross-examination, no public scrutiny of the evidence. The case was closed, and the public was left with a narrative crafted almost entirely by Chris Watts himself. A narrative that, upon closer examination, leaves much to be desired. One of the most glaring shortcomings of the investigation was the lack of thorough forensic analysis. For example, the police were quick to accept Chris's confession without fully exploring the digital evidence that could have provided a clearer picture of his actions and state of mind leading up to the murders. What about the text messages between Chris and Shanann? 
What about his phone records, his internet search history? These are pieces of evidence that could have offered crucial insights into his motivations and the premeditation of the crime, but they were never fully examined. And then there's the question of accomplices or enablers. In cases like this, it's not uncommon for investigators to look into whether the perpetrator had any help, whether direct or indirect. Did Chris confide in anyone? Did anyone notice signs of his deteriorating mental state or his growing obsession with his affair partner? Nicole Kessinger. These are avenues that should have been explored but were largely ignored once Chris confessed. By accepting his guilty plea, the court effectively shut down any further investigation into these aspects of the case. This is problematic because it leaves us with an incomplete picture of what really happened. We know that Chris Watts murdered his family, but we don't fully understand why or how. And in the absence of a trial, we lose the opportunity to scrutinize the investigation itself to question whether law enforcement did everything they could to bring all aspects of this tragedy to light. The guilty plea also raises important ethical questions about the justice system's role in providing closure. On one hand, a quick resolution spares the victim's families from the trauma of a lengthy trial, and it ensures that the perpetrator is held accountable. But on the other hand, it also means that the case is never fully examined in a public forum. The details remain buried and the public is left with more questions than answers. One of the key criticisms of the Chris Watts case is that it was resolved too quickly. The entire process from the time Shanann and the girls were reported missing to the time Chris was sentenced took less than three months. In many ways, the speed is commendable it demonstrates the efficiency of the justice system, but it also means that there was little time for reflection, little time to dig deeper into the complexities of the case. Did the investigators overlook potential evidence in their rush to secure a confession? Were there psychological or emotional factors at play that we may never fully understand? And what about the impact of the plea deal on the broader pursuit of justice? These are questions that linger, even as Chris Watts sits behind bars. Let's take a minute to consider the broader implications of this case. The Chris Watts case is far from the only instance where a guilty plea has brought an investigation to a premature end. In the criminal justice system, plea deals are often seen as a way to avoid the uncertainty of a trial and to secure a conviction with minimal resources. But this efficiency comes at a cost. It often means that the full story is never told and justice is only partially served. In cases like this, where the crimes are so heinous and the stakes so high, it's crucial that the investigation is as thorough and transparent as possible. The public has a right to know the full extent of what happened and the victim's families deserve to have every question answered. But when a case is resolved through a plea deal, these opportunities are lost. The narrative becomes fixed and the truth becomes elusive. This isn't to say that Chris Watts should have gone to trial. Given the overwhelming evidence against him, a trial might have seemed like a formality, a grueling process with a foregone conclusion. But trials are about more than just determining guilt or innocence. They're about holding the entire process accountable, about ensuring that every aspect of the case is examined and understood. And in this case, that didn't happen. As we draw to a close, it's important to reflect on what we've learned from the Chris Watts case. We've seen how the desire for a quick resolution can sometimes lead to oversights and missed opportunities. We've seen how a guilty plea can bring a sense of closure, but also leave us with lingering doubts and unanswered questions. And we've seen how the pursuit of justice is not just about catching the perpetrator, but about understanding the full scope of the crime 
and ensuring that all aspects of the case are thoroughly investigated. For the families of Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and unborn baby Nico, justice was served in the sense that Chris Watts will spend the rest of his life in prison. But for those of us who seek to understand the deeper truths behind such tragedies, there's still much to ponder. What led Chris Watts to commit such a horrific act? Were there signs that were missed? Interventions that could have been made? And what can we learn from this case to prevent future tragedies? These are the questions that remain, even as the case itself is officially closed. And perhaps, in time, we'll find the answers we're looking for. But until then, the story of Chris Watts serves as a reminder of the complexities of justice and the importance of looking beyond the surface to find the truth. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Crime Science. If today's discussion left you with more questions than answers, you're not alone. This is a case that continues to haunt and perplex, and it's one that we'll likely revisit in the future. If you're really into analyses of this case, please go over and visit Zawoki here on YouTube. He's got a multitude of videos that analyze just about every aspect of this case from just about every creator who's looked at the case. Look him up on the search bar or I'll leave a link in the description for you. Be sure to subscribe and leave me a like if you found this episode thought-provoking. And if you go over to my buddy Zawoki, give him a subscription and a like too, would you please? Until next time, stay curious, stay safe, and remember, sometimes the truth is more complicated than we can imagine.